Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Tuesday, February 24th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, a major study links fluoridated water to depression and weight gain. Then, Alaska legalizes marijuana. And the Federal Reserve head is opposed to an audit. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We are being raped and they are trying to train us like a pimp breaks his street hoe. We're being beaten like a dog by this system. Well, Janet Yellen, chair of the Federal Reserve, says she strongly opposes auditing the Fed. I bet she does. What is it that you think she doesn't want us to see? Now, of course, it's not anything unusual for the federal government to say that we're not allowed to see whatever it is that they do. Every department of the federal government is acting as if they're the CIA. But of course, the Federal Reserve is a private company. It's no more federal than Federal Express, as everyone likes to say. We're seeing this happen, of course, with the Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic Partnerships. Trade agreements that are affecting and will affect our sovereignty are being negotiated in secret by corporate lobbyists, and we're not allowed to see them. The public's not allowed to see them. Our elected representatives are not allowed to see them any more than we're allowed to see what goes on within the Federal Reserve. Now, of course, as they point out in this article, the Federal Reserve is saying that they're not going to hike rates, rates for the next few Federal Open Market Committee meetings, according to her prepared remarks. That's really nice. They give 0% money to the banks, and they're loaning this out at 5%, 25% on credit cards. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? And, of course, that allows them to play the stock market, to invest in the stock market with this 0% money. They can uh, pump the stock market up as we see that happening. Of course, we see, though, that J.P. Morgan, even though they're getting money at 0% interest, they're going to start charging corporate clients fees for leaving their money in the bank. J.P. Morgan is going to start charging big clients fees on some deposits. And, of course, J.P. Morgan is the largest U.S. bank, according to assets. They're saying they're going to charge large institutional customers for some deposits, citing new rules that make holding money for the clients too costly. See, the banks get the carrot. They get the 0% interest rate that they can then turn around and loan out at 5 to 25% interest rates. They can invest in stock markets. But if you want to try to just put money in the bank, you get the stick. That's what the new federal regulations are. As I point out, new federal rules will essentially penalize banks for holding deposits that are being viewed as prone to fleeing during a crisis or a stressed environment. So... That's going to be passed on to the clients. Of course, the, the banks are not going to swallow those fees. What about precious metals, though? They've manipulated all these other markets. Well, we see that top international banks, as reported from RT, are facing a U.S. probe for alleged precious metals market fix. See, after they've had money laundering, they've funded uh, money laundering for terrorists, for drug cartels. They've been caught involved in tax evasion, the LIBOR scandal. That's the next obvious thing, isn't it? rig the markets, especially the precious metal markets, because the precious metal markets are counter-positioned to their fiat currencies. And of course, Loretta Lynch, the appointee that's going to replace Eric Holder, according to Obama, she was deeply involved with letting HSBC go from the uh, money laundering scandals. And of course, this is one of the usual suspects, HSBC, along with J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Barclays, 10 international banks, the largest international banks, they say HSBC included in its annual report published Monday that the antitrust division of the American Justice Department asked the bank to submit documents related to an investigation into the price setting of gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. Now, of course, this is not necessarily something that's instituted by our Department of Justice. They basically said that these banks were too big to jail when they looked at uh, money laundering for drug cartels and terrorists. They're not doing anything to them for these other crimes. I certainly don't think they're the ones leading the investigation. And, of course, they really aren't. This started elsewhere. Swiss regulators, uh, the FIMA, included its metal rigging investigation into a November settlement with the UBS Group. That's a Swiss bank, one of the largest Swiss banks, one of the largest banks in the world. And one of the banks that they're looking at in this precious metal scandal, they had a settlement with the UBS Group over currency rate manipulation. There you go. Something else that they're manipulating. Not just the stock market with the money that they get at 0%. They manipulate the currency markets. They manipulate the precious metal markets. They manipulated the LIBOR markets so that they could come after the credit unions 
so that they could make more money off of variable rate interest loads, loans. As they point out, they were sued in 2013 by U.S. regulator FDIC for causing millions of dollars in losses at credit unions by allegedly rigging the LIBOR benchmark rate. You see, the big crooks go free, but the small man on the street gets brutalized by our police force for absolutely no reason. Yet another case. Every day that goes by, we have dozens of these cases. San Diego County admits that their deputy had absolutely no reason to use force or to even stop a man who had Down syndrome. This man was hit, he was pepper sprayed, and then subsequently arrested, and the only charge was he was resisting arrest, except he wasn't. New video shows that he wasn't. This is a 22-year-old man, Antonio Martinez. His school records doctors say he functions at a seven-year-old's level. They say this was a case of totally innocent, vulnerable child, essentially, that was beat up by these two guys. And guess who the two guys were? The names are absolutely amazing. We got Deputy Guy, Deputy Guy, and Captain Roddy. And I can just imagine the conversation as they're going down the street. Captain Roddy says, there's a guy. Let's just go beat him up and pepper spray him. We don't have a reason. And uh, Deputy Guy says, well, we're going to get in trouble. And Captain Roddy says, don't you understand how this works, Deputy Guy? We're cops. We have uniforms. Nothing ever happens to us. No matter how many times we do this, we never get disciplined. We never get fired. We never get put into jail. If anything happens, the, if the family sues, the taxpayer will pay it. Don't worry about it, Deputy Guy. We got it covered. That's what happens every day. And I'm really, frank, frankly, sick and tired of seeing Dozens of cases of brutality. We have a cupcake cop who attacks a 78-year-old woman. That happened today as well. When I first saw that, I thought they were talking about his waistline when they said cupcake cop. No, this is a guy who brutally attacked a 78-year-old grandmother who was trying to bring cupcakes to her children that she, grandchildren that she hadn't seen for a while because the parents were involved in a divorce. And so the cop at the school just brutalizes her. That's what happens every day. In Houston, we see now that while some rape kits set untested, suspects committed even more assaults. They say Houston officials announced Monday that they had completed DNA testing on three decades backlog of sexual assault kits. Kits That's 30 years. Now, what happened in that amount of time? Well, they had 6,600 sexual assault kits that had been backlogged for decades. It's led to 850 DNA hits. And listen to this, six suspects allegedly committed other rapes while the DNA went untested. Now, as bad as this is, Houston is the first city to get through their DNA backlog. So the other cities are even worse. They're not even concerned about serious crimes like rape. Now, one of these cases where a person who was waiting to have their DNA test uh, performed, went on to commit other crimes. Listen to what this person did. They say it's unclear why this rape kit went untested, but while it was sitting around, the perpetrator went on to commit and be convicted of burglary of a habitation, habitation with intent to commit sexual assault. He was also later sentenced for two aggravated sexual assault cases and indecency with a child. There we go. So this is one case where he was not convicted of an additional rape, but he had a long rap sheet where he could have been stopped if they had done their work. I guess they're just overlogged. I guess they just don't have enough police. I guess we need to get more police. Well, look at the same department in Houston. We have a report going back four years ago, actually five years ago, April 2010. While they had this three decade long backlog and rape kits that they hadn't tested, they're on a ticket writing spree. According to ABC News in Houston, they say in the month of March, 2010, that's five years ago, the Houston Police Department handed out more than 109,000 traffic tickets. That's 3,500 speeding tickets a day, 147 speeding tickets every hour for an entire month. And that was up over 41,000 tickets from the previous month. So I don't think they have too few police. I think they have misplaced priorities. They're out riding 147 speeding tickets an hour and not processing the rape Kits. You understand the priorities. We've seen this very clearly in New York, where they just said they're not going to write tickets or arrest people unless it's absolutely necessary, and it dropped by over 95%, and crime went down because they're not focused on violent crime. But of course, another thing that they're always focused on is the war on drugs, confiscating people's property, destroying the rule of law, 
And now we see states pushing back. Alaska today has effectively legalized recreational use of marijuana. They say in this uh, story we have at Infowars.com, it's Reuters story, smoking, growing, and owning small amounts of marijuana became legal in Alaska on Tuesday as a growing decriminalization movement reached the U.S.'s wild northwest frontier. And they say, of course, Alaska is a Republican-leaning state. It's actually a lot more libertarian than it is strictly Republican. They say anyone age 21 or older can now possess an ounce of marijuana in Alaska and can grow up to six marijuana plants, three of which can be flowering. A lot of detailed rules here. You understand how they're setting traps up for people. This is not just, all right, we're going to stop harassing people about marijuana. They are embedding in here a lot of traps. Here's some more. Smoking in public and buying and selling the drug remains illegal, though private exchanges are allowed if money is not involved. A lot of traps there. And they say, well, the Obama Justice Department has cautiously allowed the experiment of marijuana legalization to proceed. Huh. They can't stop it. Show me the law that you have in the Constitution. Show me the authority you have in the Constitution to prohibit marijuana or anything else for that matter. Why did you have to have a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol and you don't need one for marijuana? They don't have any legal authority. And if the states and the people would stand up, we could shut down this federal tyranny. And I'm glad to see them doing it. I'm glad to see them poking a finger in the eye of an intrusive all-seeing federal government. We also have, even in Washington now, we have some uh, congressmen from some of these states where they have legalized marijuana introducing bills. We have two bills that were introduced last Friday in the U.S. House of Representatives that would legalize and tax adult use of marijuana federally. The one of them, introduced by a Colorado representative, is called Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol. The bill calls for states to be allowed to choose between, uh, choose to legalize cannabis if they choose to do so without worrying about repercussions from the federal government. Yeah, of course, because they don't have the authority. And it would also remove marijuana from being a Schedule I drug. Now, of course, Schedule I says this is a narcotic that has absolutely no medical use. And we all know that's an absolute lie. Medical marijuana is very effective for a number of remedies, glaucoma, for people who are suffering nausea from uh, cancer, from chemotherapy. So the fact that they would make it a Schedule I uh, drug law, that is a lie, but they don't have any authority to prohibit it, even Schedule I laws. They don't have the constitutional power to prohibit that. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment make that very clear. Now, another bill that was put up by another congressman would essentially change it a little bit. They would not even, this bill, his bill, would not even tax medical marijuana. They would exempt it. They say non-medical marijuana would initially be set at 10 percent and eventually rise to 25 percent over time as the black market is displaced by the legal market, at which point the higher rate of 25% will encourage a new black market, which will not be as dangerous as the one that we've got right now. It'll be like the black market in cigarettes that we see in uh, New York because their taxes are so high. Of course, we also have seen someone killed over that. Eric Garner was killed over the excessive cigarette taxes and excessive uh, enforcement in New York City. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. We have some new breaking information about the effects of, guess what, fluoride. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire, 
to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com Oil of Oregano Formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules. You will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue. Wild crafted from the Mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire. This winter season, it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano. Now available in our limited first run at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139. Well, previous studies have shown a correlation between fluoride in the water and a decrease in IQ. But now it turns out that it doesn't just make you stupid, it makes you fat and depressed as well. This is a story that's uh, been done out of the UK. The Telegraph uh, points out a epidemiological study that was done there. They say fluoride in drinking water may trigger depression and weight gain, warned scientists. They looked at 15,000 people, they say, in an area that is uh, has high fluoridation in the UK alone. They say they're suffering needlessly from thyroid problems because of fluoride in the drinking water. They say the high rates of underactive thyroid were 30% more likely in areas of greatest fluoridation. The researchers compared areas to records from 7,935 general practice records, different uh, GP doctors, that covers about 95% of the English population in the years 2012 to 2013. They said that rates of high underactive thyroid were at least 30% more likely in practices that were located in areas with fluoride levels in excess of 0.3 milligrams per liter, or we can say 0.3 parts per million. Remember that number. We're going to come back to that number. They say previous studies have found that fluoride inhibits the production of iodine, which is essential for healthy thyroids. And of course, the thyroid gland, they say, regulates metabolism as well as many other systems of the body. That's why it leads to depression, weight gain, fatigue, aching muscles. And they say that women are affected 15 times more than men, about 15 in every 1,000 women. Now, the interesting thing is, is that in the UK, what allowed them to do this epidemiological study is that there's only about 6 million people in the UK that get fluoridated water. Not everybody there gets it. Now, the interesting thing here is that to protect teeth from decay, they're supplementing the water treatment works to bring it up to a one part per million concentration. Now, remember I said, remember that number, 0.3 parts per million. They are fluoridating the water, however, at one part per million. Just the day before, the Telegraph said that 0.3 parts per million would result in thyroid problems. It looked like a pretty high correlation, but they are fluoridating their water at three times that rate. But in the UK, it's only about six million people that are having their water fluoridated. Look at what's happening in the US. They say the US, of course, does it more than any other country in the world. We have not six million people, but 204 million US residents get artificially fluoridated water. That's 74% of the US population. Brazil is the second most extensively fluoridated country. They have 73 million or 41% of the population. Look at some of the countries, though, where they don't fluoridate it at all. They say that about 10 years ago, they did a study at York University, again in the UK, that found that tooth decay in children across Europe had been falling. And of course, you've seen the graph in so many of our charts here when we have articles about fluoridation showing the decline in tooth decay, and they show it in fluoridate, countries that fluoridate their water artificially and countries that don't have fluoridation in their water, and they're all declining at about the same rate. And what they point out is that in Europe, when they looked at the European countries, the countries that showed the biggest decrease in tooth decay in children were Sweden, the Netherlands, Finland, and Denmark. And they do not fluoridate their supplies. So let me repeat this. We have a high correlation between thyroid problems in the UK when they look at 95% of the people in the UK and they look at areas where they fluoridate the water, areas where they don't fluoridate the water. And they see a high correlation in thyroid disease. Then they look at Europe as a whole, and they see that the countries that have the greatest decrease in tooth decay amongst children are those that do not fluoridate their water. 
Do you see a pattern here? Do you see that it's not necessary? They're selling us something that even if it were effective, we would have to question whether it is safe to mass medicate the public in the water supply where you cannot control the concentration or the dosage that anyone receives. How do you know what dosage they're getting? Well, let's talk about the dosages that are being approved. Now, of course, as I pointed out, the article in the UK said that 0.3 parts per million were associated with thyroid damage. Nevertheless, they were supplying people at one part per million, three times, more than three times that. In the United States, the Department of Health and Human Services said that we, for, they're saying that the uh, safe range is 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million. The EPA is saying that it is four parts per million. That is more than 10 times what we saw resulting in thyroid damage. And if we go back and look at some of the stories that we've published over and over again over the years in Infowars.com, uh, just look at this one from uh, 2014, about a year ago, February 10th, 2014. Harvard study in China says that fluoride lowers children's IQ by seven points. And of course, in that study, they referenced a, uh, another Chinese study by Ding that said that they saw decreases in mental capacity at 0.24 parts per million a little bit less than what they've seen causes fluoride damage in the UK. Nevertheless, we are doing uh, fluoride in this country at three to five times that level that we would see damage to thyroid, damage to intelligence. One last quote, and this is uh, from a doctor who, Donald Miller, cardiac surgeon, professor of surgery at the University of Washington, he alleges that fluoride also damages the brain Directly and indirectly, rats given fluoridated water at a dosage of four parts per million develop symptoms resembling attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. High concentrations of fluoride accumulate in the pineal gland, which produces serotonin and melatonin. Guess what? That four parts per million that he saw uh, bringing those kind of adverse effects on lab rats, the EPA is just fine with that. That's the level they say you can go up to because I guess we're ultimately their lab rats. Stay with us right after the break. Rob Dew has a report on how they want to use this as lab rats for fluoride. And we have a look at a new organization that is enticing illegal immigration into this country and participation in the entitlement program, exponentially growing it to take down our economy. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. We're here at a supermarket in Toledo. You can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. For all of recorded history, civilizations around the world praised the health benefits of silver. At InfoWars Life, our mission is to bring you the highest quality, purest, cleanest, effective colloidal silver on the market today for the lowest price available. You don't have to be a doctor to know. The fall and winter months are the most dangerous time of year in North America when it comes to you and your family's health. InfoWarsLife.com is very excited to announce our biggest run yet of silver bullet colloidal silver exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Now InfoWarsLife.com has taken colloidal silver to the next level using a cutting edge technique that is free of toxic artificial additives. Now more than ever, it's important to stock up on high quality silver bullet from InfoWarsLife.com and to help others during Christmas by teaching them about the powerful benefits of silver. Secure your silver bullet today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. Can America survive an exponentially growing, an unlimited entitlement state? Of course they can't. That's why the globalists are bringing it on in the name of immigration. Now, of course, we've seen in the past, in the recent past, we had 
many cities that would come in and say, we're going to be sanctuary cities. We've declared ourselves as a sanctuary city. We're not going to deport anyone who comes here illegally. Now we've gone the next step. We have a president who has, against the will of the people, against the will of Congress, who would not uh, enact legislation that he wanted in order to do this. He just came out with his executive order. And now we have cities who are joining a group called Welcoming America. We had one of those come here to Austin yesterday. We have a report coming up in just a moment about that. Well, there's 49 cities in the United States that have already signed on to the Welcoming America agenda. Austin is the only one in Texas. There's six in Michigan. There's uh, four in North Carolina and Ohio, three in California. So it's concentrated in a few areas, but what they're trying to do is essentially turn this into a discussion about empathy, about treating people decently. When I talked to the lady there and asked her, I said, wait a minute, are you talking about legal or illegal immigrants? She said, we don't make a distinction between legal and illegal immigrants. Really? You don't make a distinction between those? If somebody comes into your home illegally, breaks into your home, isn't that a distinction? They talked about how the people who are really fighting this are the ranchers at the border, saying because they're loud and rich, they get heard. They don't like people walking across their property. This is about a lot more than just keep off the grass. This is about ranchers, as we've reported here at InfoWars, who have found scores of dead bodies on their ranches decomposing. They're concerned about the drug traffickers. They're concerned about the human trafficking. They go around their ranch, their private property, their home, having to carry heavily armed weapons to protect themselves. That's what this is about. This is about people coming in with a sense of entitlement, coming here without our permission, coming here in violation of our laws, and saying, we're entitled, we have rights as immigrants. And of course, this is about the distinction between positive rights and negative rights. America, as Obama eloquently pointed out when he was running for uh, Senate, he said, our Constitution is set up on a system of negative rights. It establishes our rights by prohibiting the prohibiting the government from doing things, saying you can't infringe upon our free speech, on our freedom of religion, on our freedom to protect ourselves, that type of thing. Instead, what they're doing now is they're setting up positive rights, saying we all have a right to education, we have a right to health care. And with open borders and an entitlement state, that is a prescription to take down the country very quickly. That is why you have these globalist organizations supporting Welcoming America. Here's a report that we filed yesterday. You may not have heard of this, but there's an organization called Welcoming America. And as part of that, we have welcoming cities and counties. Austin is now one of those welcoming cities. We went to talk to them today. I'm here with the chair of the Commission on Immigration Affairs. My name is Angela Jodotha Medina. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Tell us what the purpose of Welcoming America is or Welcoming well, Austin. Point well, point. the Welcoming Cities, the purpose of the Welcoming City Summit is to convene community stakeholders to kind of come together and discuss how Welcoming Austin is as a community and to find a vision for us as a welcoming community moving forward. Okay, and, and when we talk about being a welcoming community, what does that really entail? Well, one of the things that, so the city of Austin signed on to Welcoming America, became a welcoming city through Welcoming America in September 2013. Mm -hmm. And what Welcoming America, its basic platform is cities that are welcoming are cities that Im integrate immigrants in a way that they can contribute to and benefit from the prosperity of the community as a whole. Okay. So fomenting into immigrant integration. And so is this for all immigrants or is it for documented immigrants or undocumented? It's for all. We, so we, we're not differentiating. We're talking about mm -hmm. immigrants in general. <laughs> we're not differentiating. We're talking about mm -hmm. immigrants in general. So the operating word here is welcoming. That sounds so much better than sanctuary cities, doesn't it? We have welcoming cities, we have welcoming counties, we even have the organization Welcoming America. And of course their tagline is building a nation of neighbors. Sounds very much like what Nancy Pelosi said, we just have one community with a border running through it. And of course Petraeus said that this nation that we're building is the nation that comes after America. He famously had a topic in a London presentation where he said, what comes after America? Well, that's easy. North America. We've had NAFTA for a very long time, he said, 20 years. And now we find, 20 years in, that what they were implementing all along is what many of us said they were implementing all along, not just a trade agreement, but a complete restructuring, political restructuring of our sovereignty. It's nothing less than that.
Now, of course, in America so far, there's 49 welcoming cities. The only one in Texas is Austin, but there's six in Michigan. North Carolina and Ohio have four each. California and Maryland have three each. They say on their website, Welcoming America is a national grassroots-driven collaborative that promotes mutual respect and cooperation between foreign-born and U.S.-born Americans. In other words, foreign-born illegal aliens are now foreign-born Americans. We've gone from illegal immigrants to undocumented immigrants, and now they refer to them in the welcoming America, welcoming cities as just simply newcomers. This is not something that's limited to Austin or a few states like Michigan. No, this is national and it is international. They say that stakeholders will be participating in national and transatlantic learning exchanges to learn about global practices. And of course, this organization is supported by internationalists and globalists like the Intercultural Innovation Partnership. That's the UN, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations and BMW. Also, organizations like Carnegie and Western Union. And one of the organizations involved with funding this is the German Marshall Fund which frequently talks about Atlanticism. This is a globalist agenda. They talk about it as not being an agenda like Agenda 21, because that's gotten kind of a bad rap. They talk about it as being a framework. But this framework is not grassroots. It's coming from the globalists. Here's what they're talking about as part of that framework. And in this summit, some of the things that we're covering is where this morning we talked about the economic impact mm -hmm. of immigration. We had a city demographer, Ryan Robinson, come and talk about Austin's multicultural future. Mm -hmm. In other words, how we're growing as a community, what, what, I, what ethnicities are influxing and, and diminishing and, you know, how we're growing. Mm -hmm. um, then we're, we're also having career pathways for new Americans. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow we're having best practices in immigrant integration. Mm -hmm. We're having a specific section on um, executive action for employees and employers and how that affects the employment environment. We have one on Austin um, and immigrant rights, a local perspective from immigrant rights organizations. So it's a very well thought out agenda, just as we see in these Delphi techniques where they present Agenda 21 to people locally. They say, we want to work with you to help you figure out how to do whatever it is that you want to do in your community. But of course, this agenda has already been worked out, especially with things like, did you catch what she said? Executive actions and how they affect the employment workspace between employees and employers. In other words, Obama's DACA, his Dreamers, his Amnesty. How does that affect people? Now, we know that since 2000, virtually all of the new jobs, the number of new jobs that have been created, are the same as the number of jobs that have been taken by immigrants, legal as well as illegal. So in other words, for native-born Americans, there's been no increase in job opportunities. There has been a decrease in wages, a decrease in purchasing power, and there will be a massive increase in taxes that we're going to see come along to pay for this entitlement program. So while we as native-born Americans are seeing fewer job opportunities, no job growth, we're seeing higher unemployment as well as higher taxes, she talks about career paths for immigrants. Listen to how she spends this. So what kind of career paths are, are we looking at that, that's, that's different? Well, I think, I think it's just more, it, well, part of, part of the careers are like STEM and tech fields. I mean, here in Austin, many of our new techpreneurs are actually foreign-born. It's, it's like I think approximately 25% of techpreneurs in Austin hmm. are foreign-born. Um, other pathways might be... Is um, that typical or is that... And we have we have a yeah. high number. We're very yeah. lucky, actually. I think well, we're the highest of, number in Texas. Are, are those illegal immigrants, or are those people who are coming here because their employer has brought them in? Into um, the tech companies? So t uh, t they're coming with tech companies for the most part, or on special entrepreneurial visas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And when you're talking about immigration rights, mm -hmm. what type of things are we looking at? What what rights? Um, we're talking about, in general, how immigrants are treated in Austin mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, wage theft, issues like that. So you see she's muddying the water by talking about tech immigrants who have come here legally, brought here by their companies who fill out the paperwork, avoiding the topic of the massive influx of people that they're enticing to come in to go on to the welfare state, to see themselves as entitled to become dependents of native-born Americans. In terms of, of in terms of rights, though, I mean, when somebody comes here illegally, what what type of rights do they, you know, do they have the right to stay, the right to, you know, what what do they have a right to? They have a right to education. I'd say that. that any, so, I think that as a community, we can all agree that anyone who lives here has a right to be treated well. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the rights that we're focusing on, that right to be treated well. 
So she says this is just about treating people well. That's not true at all. At this seminar, they're talking about how they're going to get driver's licenses for illegal immigrants here in Texas. And of course, we've seen in other states how they're giving non-citizens the right to vote. You can't go into any of these countries. I can't, as an American citizen, go to Mexico and get a driver's license, vote there, get a free education there. This is a globalist agenda that is aimed at all Western countries, using compassion and treating people well, talking about multiculturalism, but it's designed to destroy the countries economically by entitlement programs that are unlimited and by totally open borders. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm David Knight. Now, of course, Welcoming America is saying, according to their statement of principles, that they believe the majority of U.S. residents are empathetic and compassionate people. Now, notice that they said residents, not citizens, because we've gone from illegal aliens to undocumented to now residents, and their favorite term at Welcoming America is newcomers. They say that we must treat all of our neighbors with respect and decency. Who would disagree with that? But is it respectful to come here and ignore our laws and demand entitlements Look at the story from The New American, talking about the cost of schooling. We will lose our homes through unaffordable property taxes if there is no limit to the number of children who can be brought into America with open borders and entitlements. They have the city mayor of Lynn, Massachusetts, said she was so concerned about how to pay for schools that she went to Washington asking for help from federal officials. And this is what she said. I love the fact that Lynn is a diverse community. By speaking out about this, I've been called a racist. I've been called a hater. That's not the case. I'm simply looking at this from the point of view of the economic impact that it has on my city. And that's the point of view that the globalists who are funding organizations like Welcoming America, like Welcoming Cities and Counties, the globalist organizations in the UN that are funding this kind of Agenda 21 uh, approach, they understand that we cannot afford it. That's why they're doing it. Stay with us right after the break. Rob Dew takes a look at another outbreak that shows the ineffectiveness of the flu vaccine, this time on a Navy ship. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Introducing Secret 12, the new InfoWars Life Vitamin B12 formulation. Most forms of vitamin B12 are highly processed and synthetic and cannot be properly absorbed by the body. That's why for real results, so many are having to turn to painful B12 injections, which are known to have higher absorption rates. Now, InfoWarsLife.com is excited to announce that we can bring you our most bioactive, powerful form of B12 that has been developed with our exclusive perfected process. Secret 12 is a binary of nutramedical grade bioavailable coenzyme forms of B12, methylcobalamin, the same kind used in B12 injections, and adenosylcobalamin. Secret 12 is simply taken by mouth, right on the tongue, and then swallowed. No needles, no injections. Don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Discover the secret. Secret 12. Secure your revolutionary Secret 12 formula right now at InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139. The average person's life is filled with unexpected challenges. Unlock the energy it takes to defeat these daily beasts with super male or super female vitality, specifically designed to assist the body in regulating proper hormone balance to create superior vitality in males and females. Supercharge and conquer your world at InfoWarsLife.com or call 1-88-253-3139. Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars Nightly News and InfoWars.com with a, another vaccine report. This one comes out of Canada, but it also leads back into the United States. And this is out of the globe. Canadian study finds flu shot could increase risk of getting sick. Wow, something we've been telling you all along. Now it's in a study and scientists have said it, so now we can all believe it. The study states, in particular, vaccine effectiveness against influenza A among those who received the 2014-15 vaccine without prior vaccination was higher at 43% than among those participants who were vaccinated with the same uh, vaccine component in both 2013 and 14 and 2014-15. And they're saying that was negative 15%. For those who received this year's flu shot alone, the vaccine appeared to be quite effective, about 43% effective, but if the patient had a flu shot in both years, both this year and last year, the shot was actually negatively effective, meaning it may have made people more susceptible to the flu. 
You're at a 15% increased chance of getting the flu if you got the vaccine in two years. But they didn't do a study for three or four or five years. Of course, we'll never see those, what the chances are. But at least we know they are doing something. Here we go. A negative effectiveness suggests the vaccine made people more susceptible to flu, Dr. Dickinson says. We need to do further research to understand why this has happened. Well, the vaccine attacks your immune system. That's been proven many times over. So by taking it twice, you're attacking your immune system twice, thereby increasing your chances of getting the flu. But then again, I'm not a doctor, so you shouldn't trust a thing I say. You should do your own research. Similar results were also found in the United States. More than three quarters of flu vaccines this year have been ineffective, reports the Daily Mail. The percentage of effective injections at 23% is one of the worst performances since the government started tracking how well flu vaccines work in the 2004-2005 season. So in the last 10 years, this has been the worst they've ever done, or maybe it's the best they've ever done if that's what they're looking to do is get people sick. Furthermore, both of these, they said seniors were always the least protected. But if you go to flu.gov, which is a website run by our federal government, because your immune system weakens as you age, adults age 65 and older are more susceptible to the flu. It is important seniors get their flu vaccine. It seems seniors, children, and pregnant women are their targeted groups for flu vaccination, but they've known it hasn't worked for elderly people for a long time. In fact, here in 2013, USA Today reported flu vaccine barely worked in people 65 and older. This season's flu vaccine was completely ineffective in people 65 and older, which could explain why rates of hospitalization and death have been the highest ever recorded for that age group, according to early estimates released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For those 65 and older, though, it helped in just 9% of the cases. But even back in 2013, they knew if you got the flu shot two years in a row, your chances of getting the flu increased. Effectiveness of flu vaccine raises more red flags, and this is dated 326, 2013. The influenza vaccine was 62% effective among people who did not receive a flu shot in the prior year. In comparison, vaccine effectiveness among those who did get the flu shot in the previous year was substantially lower at negative 45%. So you're almost a 50% chance of getting sick from the flu if you got the vaccine in two years. That would have been 2013 and 2012 flu seasons. In 2010, PLOS Medicine published an analysis of Canadian epidemiological studies suggesting that people who had received seasonal flu shots the year before the 2009 H1N1 pandemic had an increased risk of becoming infected with pandemic swine flu. A second study in 2009 identified similar associations between previous vaccination and pandemic H1N1 illness in a military population. Between April 21st and May 8th, a total of 97 patients developed the H1N1 virus. Of these 63 people, 66% had received the influenza vaccination in the previous 12 months. In comparison, only 40% of patients without H1N1 virus had no history of vaccination. And when you're in the military, as Joe Biggs and others have pointed out, you really don't get a say in what you get to put in your body. In fact, you get no say whatsoever. They tell you to line up and they give you whatever flu shot that year they think you need. And look what happens when the armed forces does get herd immunity. Here we are, February 24, 2015. CDC admits flu vaccine does not work. Influenza outbreak on fully vaccinated Navy ship. The CDC published a report documenting an influenza outbreak which occurred among fully vaccinated Navy personnel aboard the USS Ardent, a U.S. Navy minesweeper moored in San Diego, California while conducting training. And here's the CDC's reports from February 2014. Influenza outbreak in a fully vaccinated population, USS Ardent, February 2014. Naval Health Research Center determined that 20 specimens were influenza A, of which 18 were subtype H3N2. The HA gene sequence of the outbreak isolate was 99% identical to the strains circulating during the 2013-2014 influenza season and antigenically similar to the H3N2 component of the 2013-2014 influenza vaccine. At the time of the outbreak, 99% of the crew had received influenza vaccine. And 17 of the 18 crew members with confirmed influenza A, H3N2 infection, had received the 2013-2014 influenza vaccine less than three months before the outbreak. Just another case of the flu shot causing the flu. And now we go back in time to 2011. The Centers for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, or CIDRAP, released this article. Flu vaccine efficacy, time to revise public messages. And they are basically reporting on a Lancet article, and they found little or no evidence of the 70 to 90% efficacy for most population groups, which is what they always say. The flu vaccine is 70 to 90% effective. 
they found nothing of the sort in that. In fact, they found that it was close to 59% in adults younger than 65, and we know what happens once you get 65. And now I want to end with a couple articles from Mercola.com. The first one is in 2012, and the second one's in 2010. Here's the first. Analysis finds flu vaccine efficacy lacking as flu vaccines are suspended across Europe and Canada. That's right. In this article, it talks about several different companies and many countries in Europe and then in Canada where they actually suspended the flu vaccine because of problems with the lots. But remember the group SIDRAP, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy? Well, their director had this to say back in 2012. Michael T. Ulsterham is questioning the effectiveness of the vaccine. We have overpromoted and overhyped this vaccine. It does not protect as much as promoted. It's all a sales job. It's all public relations. And what do we see every year during the flu season? We see lots of commercials and specials everywhere and signage and all the drugstores of encouraging everyone to get that flu vaccine. Of course, it looks like it's overhyped. We've been telling you that for many years now. And now, through a, a multitude of research and articles, we're finally being vindicated with this news. And now let's look back in 2012 where the flu vaccine was being banned in several European countries and Canada. October 17th, vaccine maker Crucial, a unit of U.S. drug maker Johnson & Johnson, suspended delivery of 2.36 million doses of their seasonal flu vaccine headed for Italy and other European countries. But that's not all. On October 24th, Italy banned the sale and use of four flu vaccines manufactured by Novartis. Switzerland, Spain, Germany, Austria, and France also banned these vaccines. And then on October 27th, Canada suspended the sale and use of Novartis flu vaccines sold under the names Fluod and Agriflu, which are both manufactured in Italy. But even as far back as 2010, there was plenty of evidence that the flu shots were not safe and definitely not effective as they claim in all the ads and pomp and circumstance. Here it is, Mercola, 2010, April 8th, more proof flu shots don't work. And I'll take you down to the middle of the article under the section evidence showing flu shots don't work. After reviewing five studies conducted between 1997 and 2009, the results show that vaccination campaigns had no effect on the number of confirmed influenza cases. They also concluded that vaccinating staff has no proven impact on reducing the number of related pneumonia cases or pneumonia-linked deaths, which, by the way, count for the vast majority of what the CDC counts as flu deaths. And it lists the five studies Two in 2008, one in 2007, one in 2006, and another in 2010, which show that the vaccines are not effective. That's why they have to put out this big advertising campaign. That's to get you conditioned that you have to get the flu shot. This is all part of their scheme. And what happens after you get the flu shot? Well, you're going to get sick, and then you're going to need to get more treatment. Yet we've seen children die this year from the same strain that they were vaccinated against. Other people have had debilitating conditions. It's scary. And are you going to take that risk with your health? The pro-vaccine hysteria has reached such a fevered pitch that we now have state reps making jokes about being vaccine brain damaged like this. Anyway. <laughs> because I got destroyed my brain when I was vaccinated. No. Anyway. No, 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 no. Let's, let's be a little more serious. But I don't think it's a laughing matter, especially when you see evidence in videos of people who have been damaged by vaccines. And I've seen a lot of them, but this one really hurts the most. Hello, my name is Sue Latour. This is my daughter, Kimberly. Kimberly is a vaccine injury child. She was nine weeks old when she had her initial shot. We are very blessed to have her as good as she is. She has mental retardation. She has seizures and she has autistic tendencies and a lot of autism that showed up when she was probably 18 months old. She has had thousands of seizures over the years. We also were able to win a suit for her. Money doesn't compensate loss of life. What happens if you get the flu? You get sick for a few days. If you work on a healthy immune system, you'll get through this stuff a-okay. -okay. And I encourage you to check out some of the products at InfoWarsLife.com that can help you strengthen your immune system. It's what I do, and I didn't get the flu this year, nor did I get the flu shot. In fact, I've never gotten the flu shot, and I think I've only had the flu once in all that time that I've never gotten the flu shot since I've been 18 years old. Anyway, this is Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News.
Well, that's it for tonight. If you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll be advised of our new videos as they come online. If you're not a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, please consider supporting our operation by becoming a, sub a subscriber there. You can share that with 20 people simultaneously. They can watch the news as it happens each weeknight at 7 Central, 8 p.m., and they can share all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Thanks for joining us, and join us again tomorrow night, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. In the past decade, we have witnessed unparalleled scientific discoveries in the area of health. But no one has put together a formula that focuses directly on brain health, nerve growth factors, and optimizing your cellular energy at the same time. DNA Force is one of the most expensive formulas to produce. Some of the ingredients in DNA Force are $12,000 a kilogram. We are using the coveted, patented, only American source of PQQ, CoQ10, and more. You want the best that's out there at the lowest price anywhere? Well, we're bringing you a total win-win. The ultimate value, cutting-edge, trailblazing game changer that also supports the info war. We have produced a limited run of DNA Force, and it will take up to 12 weeks to produce more once we sell out. Secure your DNA force today at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. DNA force from InfoWars Life. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.